So here we are again in this uh, very late, early evening uh, talk at, uh, at least in my local time zone over here, uh, at uh, Gen Beyond 2020 Online Edition. Um, if you just jumped into uh, Watch Kara's uh, session, um, let me uh, first welcome you very warmly into our stream here. Um, this uh, full day, 24 hour endless streaming marathon is a replacement event for the Gen Beyond 2020 in-person conference that was supposed to happen in Lisbon uh, this weekend. Um, unfortunately, for coronavirus reasons, um, we couldn't make it happen in person. Um, but um, so far, uh, I think that uh, this, this streaming um, is a good replacement and uh, yeah, ma ma makes me a, a bit less sad about uh, <laughs> missing, missing the actual conference. Um, before we jump into Kiara's session, let me first please uh, thank you, our sponsor Plesk, uh, for supporting us. Um, let me please also repeat the hashtag for our event, which is uh, JEP20. So uh, if you have something in mind that you would like to tweet or Facebook or Instagram, uh, please append that hashtag. Um, you're also invited to tweet a selfie of yourself while you're watching that stream. We will probably collect all those uh, selfies um, and uh, share them all together, uh, enabling you people to see uh, your, your streaming colleagues, um, so to say. Uh, and last but not least, uh, cancelling that event in Lisbon was unfortunately a rather expensive thing. Um, the expense, uh, the cancellation fee was rather high. So if you have uh, a couple of euros or dollars or whatever, um, <laughs> whatever sort of money lying around, um, please feel free to hit jnbeyond.org and uh, hit on the on the donation button that we have up there. Um, this will that will help us big time organizing a new Jane Beyond in person conference next year. Uh, any help is highly appreciated. And now with these words, I'm uh, happily handing over to Kiara, uh, who's now going to present us the faultless designer in a faultless uh, stream, um, resulting in a faultless recording. Uh, during the break, Kiara and I just discussed that Kiara is having really bad luck with uh, conference session recordings at Jane Beyond. Um, so, but but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that we can now finally bust uh, that problem and uh, yeah, have a, have a faultless recording. <laughs> Uh, thank you, David. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me. I think it's amazing that we are replacing the, the real Jane Beyond with this streaming. Um, I'm also very happy to be here and sharing my uh, this talk with the community, uh, which is a talk I really love, mostly, um, because uh, I think during this time of lockdown, everybody, has, or most of us, has sit down and think, what they've learned, what, where are they, uh, when are, where are they with their life? And so this time of break has probably brought us to face our own fear, our own, or reflect on where we want to go. So, and this talk is just about this. It's about my own experience as a designer and my personal crusade to find out how to be better in what I'm doing. So how to be a better designer. And because uh, Joomla is about web design and so it's all about internet and how we can create bad experience on internet, I just created this talk so that it could reflect this kind of experience, so the experience that, is, uh, that can happen online. Of course, um, this figure that I created, it comes from, which is the faultless designer, it comes from um, a question that I had was uh, how, uh, what are the ideal attributes for a designer to possess those kind, those timeless, versatile qualities that work with just about any trend and can be easily applied to all design fields. So that was my question. And this is how the figure, the brand new figure of uh, the fault led designer came to life. So, going to what it was my life and what it means to be a faultless designer. The faultless designer is the person who is able to create more with less. And uh, so it's the person who is using 
uh, is searching and finding possibly some simplicity hacks for uh, um, his own life as a designer. But it could, of course, it could be applied to anything. But I, I decided that my life is really strictly related to uh, my life as a designer. And I went back to 20 years ago when my research started. Um, and uh, it started in fact in 2000 uh, when I felt fearless and, and I left my homeland in Sicily and move to Milan, the capital of design, and start design, and start, you know, designing, um, and starting design uh, for. Um, um, I, I mean, I start studying design at the Polytechnic of Milan, and I stayed there until two thousand eight, when I start to be doubtless, and I decided that Milan was enough, and I wanted to move to Greece. And this two thousand eight actually is the date where I first met Joomla. Uh, <clears throat> I designed at that time the Joomla magazine, the first series of the Joomla magazine, and I started to get in contact with the Joomla community. I didn't know about Joomla before, so that was when uh, the Joomla love started, my relationship with Joomla started. And then in 2012, I, I was restless. I left the agency I was working with and I started to think of a career as a freelancer. And then I started working as an art director and designer, and web designer and UX designer uh, for different companies by having my own company, the Until Sunday company organization, which today is a more collaborative organization. And the research hasn't finished. In fact, I'm still thinking many other ways how I can be better in what I'm doing and how I could be a better faultless designer, how I can create more efficient and enjoyable products, whatever they are on the web and print, whatever they are apps or websites, it doesn't really matter. The important is that how I can, can I apply these five qualities that I found during my research. And imagine, it took me 20 years to, to actually come out with these five attributes for the faultless designer. Of course, when we talk about doing less, we also have to think about doing more. And the five attributes are, in fact, about taking, but also adding. And so when one, the first attributes of being a good um, faultless designer, it's about uh, removing or had, um, having less confusion and adding more focus. It's about having less information but adding more meaning. It's about less frustration and having more time. It is also having less error and more trust. And finally, it's also trying to detract the nonsense and having more care. So these are uh, the five characteristics of the faultless designer. And uh, because practice is far more illustrative than theory, I would like to show you my personal way of interpreting um, these uh, characteristics, these qualities, uh, in some, with some examples of my work that I've done in the past years. And uh, introduce you these five concepts, which took me 20 years to put together. So the first one is about less confusion and more focus. And it's about categorize, organize, and prioritize information. A few, uh, one year ago, I finished to read a book of this uh, Japanese organizing consultant author, which, whose name is uh, Mary Kondo. I don't know if you know her, but she wrote a very nice book the life-changing magic of tidying up. And um, the, just to sum up their method, the KonMari, this is the method, the name of the method is called KonMari, from her name, Mary Kondo. Um, the KonMari method that she suggests, it's about encouraging people to be ruthless in discarding items that clutter their houses. So she thinks that our life is uh, about 
adding things stuff and at the end we are so full so filled up with this stuff that we don't know where to put new things actually we cannot leave and we cannot start um living better so she's suggesting that whatever doesn't spark joys needs to be removed and i thought that this method is very simple but i am a person who actually like filling their house with stuff and memories and things i'm very afraid to throw away things so it took me a while to start using their methods to my daily life. But I start thinking that uh, this method could be applied in uh, um, anything about web design. Uh, if we think about designing a website as uh, designing a, a house, then you can get the picture. So imagine a website as a house. So each page is it's like a room and each room it's a kind of interacting between them and each room needs to contain specific uh, elements right we cannot have things that we have in the bathroom in the bedroom and vice versa right we cannot have things in that we have in the kitchen also in the bathroom but maybe we can have some things that could relate to you elements so maybe we can have a door so that the interaction between these two environments could be easy so i was thinking that the website could be could, we can think about a website as a um, a big house where all these pages needs to be interact between them, but also the content needs to be somehow um, um, organized and, um, and information needs to be um, specific for each page. We cannot have everything everywhere, right? So applying the Mary Kondo, so the Comari method to websites, I decided that I started to design website by not even from the white framing, but from a white page, like the one you see here. And what I do is putting down all the kind of content that that specific page needs to have. Some of the content is suggested by uh, the client, some other is something that I think the page should have. So I start writing down all these elements. This is, a, is the re actual content of a specific landing page that I designed for a, a portal, for a magazine, or for an online magazine. And um, I start to really put down like a list, uh, a wish list, all the content that I wanted to have. And uh, after, uh, and then what I did was adding some kind of symbols next to it. So I, um, I add a symbol of the star for all the content that was mandatory. So this content, these specific elements or block of information needs to be on the page. Then I have a shape, uh, I added the symbol of the heart for all the content that needs to, that I would love to have in that page, but um, I need to see where it fits. And then I have another icon, which is the eye which I used to uh, add in content that nice to have, but if it doesn't really fit, I just discard it. And this is a very simple way to understand what information is really essential for each page. So imagine that I did this kind of uh, um, uh, list for every page that was inside the magazine. In this case, I'm just showing you the, one I, the, the list related to the specific landing page. Um, then I jump into, once I decided the kind of content that I want, so prioritizing, so what I did was prioritizing the content, I start to organize in it on a wireframe page, so on a wireframe. So I don't even go into the design phase, I just stop into what is the wireframe. And the reason is very simple. I found out that somewhat with some clients, it's easier to talk about um, content and interaction if they don't see colors, images, and other uh, elements, just because they become very emotional with colors and typography, that they forget about the important things. What kind of content do we want on this page? What kind of interaction we want to create? What is the goal we want to achieve with this page? Where, where do we want the, the user to click on? So the wireframes, which I usually create a variation of two to three wireframes, help me actually to create this kind of conversation. And the final uh, result is something that is, uh, of course, the design of the, uh, the real websites. So 
um, this is actually the real uh, magazine, how it, go, it went live when, uh, uh, after I designed it. And, and it was a combination of the two wireframes that end up to be uh, the final design of uh, the Spore magazine landing page. It's a magazine for uh, NGO and not-for-profit company uh, based in, uh, in the Netherlands. So, of course, including less information means more white space, which brings us to the second rule or the second quality of the faultless designer. So less information and more meaning. So appreciate the white space. And here I want to bring you with me to an experience I had in 2018. I was invited to speak at the Smashing Conference uh, in New York, and it was my first time in New York. So I spent a few more days after the conference to visit the city. Um, and that was a, a very nice experience in many ways. And one of the places I wanted to visit was the National September 11 Memorial. I wanted to see this place because I've never been there, so I, never was, I was never lucky to see the twin, twin Towers. But I wanted to see how this place has become after the, uh, that very, uh, you know, the very bad day that the Americans, but all the world, had. So I, I visited this place and I don't know if any of the audience saw this place, but it was a, it was a very interesting experience. So when you arrive, you, you come out from the metro and you, you land, you arrive on this place and, and it's, and, and you, what you will see is just a full empty space with trees and little bench, uh, benches all around. And then where the two towers stand, stand it in the past, I mean, where the, where the two towers were, now there are two big pools, big like the perimeters of the towers. And it's like a void, void. so there is a, this pool, there is water coming inside. And all along the, the walls of these pools, there are, the name, there, there are written the names of the people who actually died that day. And if you are a person and uh, arriving at this place, you, you will probably think, wow, amazing. This is so much space empty that they could have used in a different way, maybe for more practical use, not just to fountain, huge swimming pools, just throwing water endlessly in the void. But I think these two pools had a meaning in that moment. They force our mind to reflect upon and think about the tragedy, tragedy of that day. So in that moment, that empty space, that white space had given, was given meaning to a very specific moment, event of our life. So, and this is where the white space, I think, means respect. When I designed the Joomla brand manual, it took me a while to let people understand that we need to have a clear space around the logo, that we cannot put anything we want around the logo because we need to get to respect the logo and the design of the logo itself. And I don't think I arrived to this. I mean, I, didn't, I, I, I know that I didn't have this knowledge when I started designing, but it, it started slowly to grow inside me that we needed more space and we didn't need to clutter the page or every element we design of information just because it doesn't really work. So I want to bring you back just because it's already 10 years of Jane Beyond and I want to bring you back to the first edition of Jane Beyond that happened in 2010. And I remember the first talk I had with Brian and Robert and Alex at that time and what the, the idea of the Jane Beyond as a, an event that was going to gather all the Joomla uh, community people from all around the world. And I want you to remember that the Joomla, the Jane Beyond happened even before the Joomla World Conference. So this was the one of the, the first international conference to gather people from all over the world. And, uh, and that was amazing. I mean, it was nice to, to design and think about this conference. And this was the first website. As so you can see, I, I, I had a very little understanding of white space. 
And that this was built with Joomla. I don't know if it was Joomla one point something. I really don't remember, but I remember I crammed the page with everything Joomla was making me able to do. So there were news, there were the speakers, there were um, the Twitters, and there was were banners, there was uh, the sponsor and everything. And I remember the second year, it didn't go even better. So it seems like I didn't learn much the first year. So that page was even more, it was even feel it, filled more with more information and with more um, elements. We had a slideshow on top, then we had the speakers on the side, the news in the middle, the blog style news in the middle. And then, I don't know if you can see, we also had a very tiny video player on the home page. And while I was creating these slides, I was thinking, oh my God, but who was going to actually click on that video that is big like a stamp on the envelope? I mean, I was like, this is nonsense. This is crazy. But this is how we were used to design Joomla websites in the past. We were just putting on top whatever we Joomla could do because we, it, was, it was like the JMBian website was like, what um, was like, whatever Joomla can do, we need to show in the JMBian website. So that was... And it took many years until we came out with the, and we, we came out with a better design and understood that by increasing the amount of white space, actually by adding less content and increasing the amount of um, space, you natur naturally give to each element its own dignity and meaning. Exactly at these two pools in New York we're doing for. Uh, the, the user, the, the, the people were visiting the memorial place. So you can create a very elegant and clear um, design without cramming the page of too many elements and giving to each page the right amount of information. This is also the website that we designed for the 2020, which went live for very shortly. And then we, put, we, we, we had to change it because uh, the event didn't take place, and now we are here having 24 hour streaming Jane Beyond event, which is kind of nice because it brought us anyway all together. So, talking about the uh, empty space, talking about organizing content, of course, we help people to navigate and enjoy the products we design with less frustration and more time. So to create a more enjoyable experience. And despite being Italian, right now I'm connecting from uh, Ciros. Ciros is the place I spent my months in lockdown. And I felt very lucky to be here because even if I was going out just for doing some shopping, I had the opportunity to work by the sea while I was going to the supermarket and um, I, I enjoyed the time here. I thought we were all locked down. I couldn't see my friends. I couldn't, I couldn't spend my time with my family in Italy. Um, but anyway, I felt very, very lucky to be here. And Ciro is the, is the place where I learned the third um, the third important quality of the faultless design. Because Ciro's gave me back a few years ago when we moved here from Athens, it gave me back what no city could give me back. And you can guess what it is. It's something that doesn't, money cannot buy. And it's time. Time, it's an important part of, uh, important part and dimension of the design. And time is not just about loading time. It's not just about um, how fast your site um, load on the page or how fast you are able to answer specific questions. I mean, time is different. The perception of time is different depending on the users. And for this reason, for the first time in my life, I had to work with a very specific target when I designed the app for Valise. Valise is an app that uh, is created by a logistic company based in the Netherlands and it help um, people who need assistance, so impaired people physical, with physical impairment or mental impairment, they, they need assistance to travel using public transportation. So this app actually helps these people booking an assistant 
or a taxi is going to bring them to the train station, to the bus station, so they can take their own um, transportation. And, um, and I designed this app. I designed first the web app, and then it was time to design uh, the real app for mobile because uh, there were many young uh, users start using um, the app uh, on, on their smartphones. So we needed a, a mobile version of the same app. And this was the moment I started to think, how, the, how, the, how, this, how, these people, how do these people perceive time? What's the kind of perception, which is completely different from my perception of time, because I have legs to run, I, I'm okay, I don't get stressed, I, get, I, can, I, I have all the time I want to get ready for my next trip. But these people actually are, some of them have autistic syndrome, some of them ha, are in, have some kind of physical impairment, so the, the perception of time is completely different. And that moment I understood that it was important to give timely um, feedback every, as, soon, as soon as they were um, booking their own ride. So I had to design different cards that were giving them uh, once they were logging into the uh, app. Um, I, I had to design different cards that were giving a sense of time, of the time that was passing and moving forward. And also we couldn't have so many push notifications which could give them a heart attack. We, we had to do this in a way that was uh, nice and uh, feedback at the right time, let's say that way. And so there were feedback for uh, when the, the um, ride was scheduled. So if they schedule a ride in two days, if they were logging in into the app, they could see the first screen they would see was that the next ride would happen in very specific time of the day and hour and from and this destination and the um, the departure place and all the information were on this little card. And then we had other cards that I had to design. One was when the, 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 um, the ride was coming and the other one was about when, if the ride was late for any specific reason, maybe there were, uh, there were delays due to traffic or roadworks. Time was also an important thing when they were actually making, actually booking in, during the booking process, which was very, very long for first um, time users. They had that they had to register or they had to save their uh, very frequent um, travels. So the right information has to be divided in manageable chunks so they actually were, they were not getting confused or overwhelmed with too many information which for people like me, there wouldn't be a problem. It would be just a long form to fill. But for them, it would have been like, where am I done with this? Because I want to, am I doing it right? Am I doing, so you had to give them some kind of sense of progress and some kind of sense of rewards. And this is why I divided on the top, there were different forms. I mean, there were different sections of the forms. And each uh, session was divided in the three different steps. And each step, when concluded, had, was marked as uh, uh, done. So they had a kind of confirmation. If the step was not correctly filled up, then they could go back and fill it up. So there was another symbol appearing. So they, there were different elements that were giving them um, uh, specific information at the right time and also guiding them while they were making their booking process, which could lead to very easy errors, which we didn't want. And we didn't want also to, them to be very frustrated. And, um, and also time was important when they were traveling because uh, users needed to check the, their journey while they were traveling, especially because some of those traveling, uh, I mean, those traveling moments needed also some changes in trains or change of transportation. So they were on the train and they had to go then on the bus. So they needed to know where they need to get ready. And they needed to know this in the, in the, the, at the right time uh, and not too late or too, too uh, or before the, the train was probably approaching the station. So we, the idea was, uh, in general, of this app was to reduce the amount of discomfort in a complex 
task, but also to give them the right amount of feedback to guide them, the user, throughout the journey. Not only the journey as a traveling with Valise, but the journey also using the app. So, um, and this was that this kind of app brought very happy result because also the waiting time was not so frustrating for them. And uh, talking about less frustration, we also need to talk about the less error and adding more trust to our design, which means design for consistency. We, and we are now at the fourth attribute of the fourth less design designer. So we go back to New York and uh, my experience in New York, as I told you, was my first time and uh, I felt like I was always living in this city. And I didn't know what it was because I was thinking, I've never been here, okay, I watched all the episodes of Sex and the City, I was a big fan of fame when I was a child, but again, I've never been in New York, so how, how why does this city feel so uh, familiar to me? And then I understood why. So if you have been in New York, you may know that the city in Manhattan, it's like uh, a, a giant grid and everything, every road is divided in avenue and streets. And the avenues are running from north to south and the streets are running from east to west. And so whenever you want to meet someone, you just meet them and then they are numbered, of course, one, two, three, four, five. So if you want to meet someone, you just give the indication you want to meet them at the corner between one street and an avenue. And I thought that this is amazing because this is so easy. You cannot get lost in this way. This is very difficult to, to lose your orientation in a very, in a grid like this. I mean, it's like playing the novel battle. It's very, very easy. And uh, I feel like I was in control. I feel like I, I was living the city. And I feel like I always, I, I feel like I could trust the city somehow. And the nice thing is that the same kind of uh, way of thinking is used also for all the transportation. So you don't need to know a very strange name, like I used to know in Milan or when I was uh, going with the metro. Sometimes I, I just didn't remember where I needed to go and I was thinking the wrong, that, the wrong direction. In this, in this moment, you don't need to think about names. You have just think, just to think when you go down to the metro in New York, you just have to think, do I want to go north? Do I want to go south or east or west? And that's it. And then you just remember a number and you, you find your own stop. And it's so easy. I found it so uncomplicated, so practical, really. And um, I wish many cities had this similar kind of way of working because I think it would solve so many issues probably. We didn't need any GPS to go around the cities. But anyway, going back to my design, it's such a thing that this kind of familiarity that we feel should happen also in web design every time. And for this reason, whenever I design something, I always try to create a consistent, harmonious experience by creating um, a design system, which adds an unspoken layer of trust to your website or to any design you will do, also an application or even in print, of course. Um, so I, when I design websites, even, when I start designing a few pages, I start categorize all the elements I created in a kind of design library so that the experience is uniform and intuitive everywhere across the world site. And, and every time I need to add a new element, I try to refrain uh, of adding, from adding numerous uh, different variations of the same element. So I try to avoid we have too many buttons, I try to avoid we have too many colors because I understood with experience that this, although it looks nice, at the end it's very chaotic and very difficult to manage in the long term. So by having a design system, you, you can create an experience that's really familiar and really uh, consistent across the different pages. And you don't have to, as a designer, I don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time because as soon as I have these little chunks of information, little elements, I just need to play them around on the page and create new more elements. So new more pages with different meanings, with different content, but it doesn't really matter because the base or the base of the frame, the skeleton of the design is always there. And I already have it in a kind of system that I can always take and reinvent in the way I want it. 
And of course, there are many discussions about heavy design systems. I also heard designers telling me, oh, come on, heavy design system makes everything so flat, so boring. And I'm like, it doesn't really work that, well, that way. And the reason is very simple. The reason why a design is not boring when it's consistent is because we are going to add the fifth element or the fifth quality of the faultless designer, which is the motion. So how to create less no sense and give more care. And this is the last uh, attribute. And I'm going to talk about my one of the most beautiful trips that I had in my life, which was in Japan. <clears throat> and it happened um, three years ago. And this is a picture I took from my Shikansan. It was bringing me from Kyoto, was traveling from Kyoto to Tokyo. And it was a beautiful day after a very strong typhoon that hit Kyoto the day before. And I took this picture um, and I remember the, the trip I had, it was amazing. And I really loved the Japanese culture. Um, I used to love it before, but I, when, while I was there, I started to love the general way of thinking of the Japanese. And I remember the last day I was, uh, the last day we were sitting on the airplane that was going to bring us back to Europe. And my husband was next to me and it was raining cats and dogs outside. A new typhoon was going to hit Japan again. And we were about to, to start, you know, we, I mean, the, play, the plane was ready to, um, uh, to fly and it was leaving the parking lot. So the finger, so they would start moving, the plane would start moving. And I remember I, I was thinking, oh my God, let's hope we're going to have a nice trip because if we find the typhoon on our way back, I don't know how it's going to be for us. And I remember while watching outside the window, there were all these baggage handlers and staff collecting baggages and, and uh, feeling the airplane that was just next to us. And when in the exact moment when the, our plane left the parking lot, these people under the rain immediately stop. They left their tools and they start bowing, you know, the Japanese way. And they start waving us goodbye. I told my husband, oh my God, this feels so uncomfortable. Am I, are we going to die? Are they waving us goodbye? Because this is the end. You know, typhoon, airplane, a lot, lot of wind, a lot of rain. I don't know what you think. We had 12 hours of flight to Dusseldorf, so I was really, really afraid. I didn't understand at that, at that exact moment what these people were actually doing. And I found out the reason of they waving a few days after reading the book Ikigai, The Japanese Secret to a Long and Happy Life. So in this book, I found out why these people stopped their job and start waving us goodbye. It was not because they, we had the typhoon. It was not because it was raining. They were not waving us goodbye because uh, uh, they were they are just kind. But because the Japanese Japanese people believe in a very specific philosophy, the philosophy of eight millions gods. They believe that everything that we touch as human beings has a soul, takes some kind of energy from us, and so it needs to be treated with respect. So whatever is around them, so uh, the environment, even objects, physical objects, needs to be treated with care and love. Of course, I'm not suggesting you to be the faultless designer by loving the buttons you are designing, but I'm suggesting you to be a faultless designer, thinking and always having in mind who is going to be your end user. And this is something that happened to me when I designed this other app, the bus driver app. Uh, it was designed for the logistic, um, the logistic company uh, Transvision. They are based in the, in the Netherlands. It's an app for contractors uh, and it's used by Trans Transvision, by the company, to ensure the continuous quality of their transportation service and avoid the drivers who are not available when needed are, in, in, are, um, are called to work. Or maybe those who have worked excessive hours, like more than eight hours, uh, could be uh, instead um, um, signed as not available. So in general, it's used for tracking the time of the driver. So that was, and the MVP of this application was very simple. We want a tracking button and that's it. This is what I had as a brief. And I, and I started to think, come on, this cannot be the, the application. I mean, we are asking these people 
to just press a button. And we don't want that. I mean, how can we convince them? How can we tell them that this is, this is how their day is going to start? By pressing, login and pressing a button. So, and I was also thinking, think about the bus driver, the one who is driving children at school that has to start the day. Maybe he had a terrible morning, the coffee machine didn't work, or maybe the car was broken and he has to walk or take a taxi to reach his place. And then he has this stupid app that he has to log in and track his uh, time. And he's already in a bad mood. So how can we convince this person that this is something he needs to do? You can tell him you are fired if you don't, of course you can, but why have we have to arrive to that? I mean, we could do other, we could play other ways around. So I start to think about these people and I start to create extra elements. First of all, a welcome page, whenever they were logging in, there was uh, um, talking to them by name. And I start to think about how I can create a memorable, memorable and emotional experience even if it's just a tracking button. It's a tracking app, app with a tracking button. So I start to think about the, how we could add a better experience for them. But also, I, I start to think they, for the work they are doing, they deserve more than a boring app. They deserve to be, they deserve a thank you for bringing children back home to their parents. They deserve thank you for bringing people around the city. They deserve more than just a button to press. So along with the main functionality, again, the big blue button that you saw before, I designed uh, some reward cards. So whenever they would finish the shift, these cards were appearing. So if they had done like eight hours of work, there was a, a glass of beer waiting for them because they truly deserve one. And if they had done less, maybe they had a piece of Gouda or if they were checking the calendar to see their shift for the day after, there was, uh, the app was telling them that, they, yeah, that the app was smart, but not smart enough to predict the future. So we added this uh, nice reward card to be displayed at the end of each shift to thank the driver for their kind work, for their hard work, for bringing home people, for bringing people around in the city. And seeing this, I just want to make a recap. So we have seen together the five different elements, the five different attributes of the faultless designer. And it's about being focused. It's about adding meaning. It's about preserving time. It's also about building trust, but also it's about trailing the right motion. And uh, these are just the beginning of uh, your design transformation, my design transformation. It took me 20 years. So I'm sure there are more characteristics that I could add to this list. And if these five elements are too many, I just ask you to follow one golden rule that come from John Meda. He wrote an amazing book about simplicity. And uh, this quote says that this role that he um, wrote in this book is about simplicity. Um, and he says, simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. So you can just use this one role to start with. And then if you can, you start using all the five. So this is the end of my presentation. I just want to thank you. And David, I don't know if you're still there. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm here. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, give, to uh, present this uh, presentation that for me means a lot. I also um, want to thank um, Jim Beyond uh, because it's already so many years that we have done this event and uh, I was so very, very sorry to know that we were not going to be in Lisbon this time of the year. And, and I also want to thank the Joomla community because uh, all these lessons that I learned in 20 years, I, I learned through the community as well because I, I work with many of you and I learned a lot of things from you. And some of you have been so brave to run with me run with me and my crazy ideas. Some of you have been so brave to uh, enforce some of the things I've said or I wanted to be that way. So I just want to thank the Joomla community for always being uh, so supportive with me and with my work. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, that's the only thing I wanted to add <laughs> for today.
Well, um, all I can say is thank you for the presentation. Thanks for being around for 10 years. Uh, a special thanks for uh, supporting JEP over all these years. Uh, when we were hanging out in the uh, in front of the office earlier today and were thinking about the very first Jane Beyond uh, that you also mentioned during your presentation, uh, which was, I think, a bit outside of Frankfurt, Germany, in the spot yeah. right in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, where, where, where we had this uh, this bar uh, downstairs, which was self service, um, mm -hmm. a self service bar for two hundred people for three days, and um, I think the 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 biggest oh wow moment that I had at that conference was at the end of the conference when we asked people to please pay their self service bar bill, and at the end of the day it worked out. Oh, and okay. I I I, I can't. I can't imagine another community where three days of self-service bar just work. Uh, I think that 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 speaks uh, that 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 has its own message about the Jima community. Yeah, exactly. No, I I don't remember about that event. I mean, I don't remember about this specific moment, but I remember uh, how nice it was to meet all of you in up close, and and I was very shy and very. Um, you know, very emotional about being there. Um, also to meet in person, uh, Brian, Robert and Alex, yeah. because at that time they were the organizers and, and, uh, um, and I had a very nice, um, you know, experience talking with them. And of course, beer was always around. Uh, I having tea, so I'm not really into the Jane Beyond mood. Oh, you have beer now, okay. So <laughs> I have tea. I just wanted to have a glass of wine, but then I thought like, okay, let's put it a little bit more professional. So I should have been like you. Uh, next time, next time, next time. Let's oh, let's hope we are gonna have the streaming, of course. But let's hope, let's hope we're gonna have a live event as well with um, all the people joining us. Lisbon or any anywhere else. The important is to be able to hug each other, have a you know a group photo as always we do, and all the things we have always done uh, with Jane Beyond. So a little bit nostalgic. I'm very sorry, guys. I mean, I'm getting nostalgic and emotional, but I it's a very nice event and a lot of memories come when I think about it. So sure. <laughs> well, no, nothing to add. Then uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, mm. We're taking a short 10 minute break okay. and then we'll be back with uh, Tim Davis, hopefully. Um, Tim, if you already listened to us, I think the uh, tech guys are trying to reach out to you. Um, maybe you can fire up clip right away um, and we can sort this out. Um, yeah, so thanks.